Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of ancient legends. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Neeling. And today our topic is Japanese folklore, which is, of course, an enormous category. We couldn't possibly do justice to the whole of Japanese folklore throughout history in one episode. So today we're actually going to focus on two specific stories, kind of a story time thing. We're just going to, we're going to read them and talk about them. Paul and I each chose one from a collection of stories. So there are many different variations of these folk tales, of course, but the versions we're reading today were published in 1908 by a woman named Ye Theodora Ozaki. She translated a lot of Japanese fairy tales and short stories around that time. And she also had a pretty interesting life, if you want to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, I do. Okay, then. She was born in 1871, the daughter of Baron Saburo Ozaki. He was one of the first Japanese men to study in the West. And Ye's mother was Bathia Catherine Morrison. Bathia. I've never heard that name before. Pretty old-fashioned sounding, but I kind of like it. Sounds like an 1800s name. Yeah. And she was the daughter of one of her and her husband's teachers, if that makes sense. So they studied together. You know, the, the Japanese guy and, and this woman. Mm-hmm. And the woman was the daughter of one of the teachers. Yeah. Okay. So after being married for five years, Ye's parents separated. And her mom had custody of her until she was a teenager when she was sent to live with her father in Japan. And apparently she liked it a lot there. But when her father arranged a marriage for her, she refused, left, and became a teacher slash secretary. And over the years, she traveled back and forth between Japan and Europe, lived in a lot of different places, and started translating these stories. And here's the craziest fact. This is so cool. Her letters, like letters to her, were often misdelivered to an unrelated Japanese politician, Yukio Ozaki. She was Ye Ozaki. The letters got delivered to Yukio Ozaki. And vice versa, she would receive his letters sometimes. And eventually, the two of them actually met in person, ended up getting married. Oh, I knew you were going to say that, (laughs) but I was like, come on, really? (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Well... It's a very practical solution. Let's just live together, and then we'll all get the mail we need. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So pretty pretty interesting life. Pretty exciting, sounds like. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, so these stories that she translated were published, like I said, 1908. They're firmly in the public domain because they're so old, so we don't have to worry about copyright stuff, so we can read them word for word. Good. Because I've been threatened with lawsuits so many times in the last month. I know. What, what's up with that, Paul? What you been up to? <laughs> I've been telling people to put a mask on. They don't like that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Let's not even get started. That's such a depressing topic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Let's wait 10 years and then reminisce about it when we can laugh. Yeah. Hopefully in 10 years we'll be able to look back on it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. So... I wanted to give credit where credit is due to Ye Ozaki for translating these wonderful stories for us. And to give a little more background about these stories that we're going to be reading, these are from a collection called Japanese Fairy Tales. Pretty basic title. But the translations are based on a Japanese version of the story that was written down by Sadanami Sanjin. Um, Another note about these, Ozaki herself said that, quote, These stories are not literal translations, and though the Japanese story and all quaint Japanese expressions have been faithfully preserved, they have been told more with the view to interest young readers of the West than the technical student of folklore. Good. Yeah. That's us, right? We're we're young, interested readers. Yeah, translating books and stories in other languages is always difficult. Because do you do the word-for-word literal translation, or do you try to get the spirit of the message the best way in the other language and culture that you can? Yeah, and if you're trying to be academic about it and you know create a translation for scholars to study, you need to be like super careful and exact. But 
it sounds like these stories are more just to get the idea across of the story and, you know, translate them in a way that they're easy to read and understand and just kind of get the main points across. Yeah, which is perfect for us. Yep. All right, so that's my intro to these stories. Ready to get started, Paul? I am. All right. Why don't you start with your story so I can <clears throat> recover my voice a little bit, get a little hoarse, I think. I've got a nice story. Fun little story. The Jellyfish and the Monkey by Ye Theodora Ozaki. I can't imagine why those two animals would ever meet, but... You're about to find out. I'm it's excited. quite the story. Yeah, let's hear it. Long, long ago in old Japan... The kingdom of the sea was governed by a wonderful king. He was called the Rian Jin, or the Dragon King of the Sea. His power was immense, for he was the ruler of all sea creatures, both great and small. And in his keeping were the jewels of the ebb and flow of the tide. The jewel of the ebbing tide, when thrown into the ocean, caused the sea to recede from the land, and the jewel of the flowing tide made the waves to rise mountains high and flow in upon the shores like a tidal wave. The palace of Rianjin was at the bottom of the sea and was so beautiful that no one had ever seen anything like it, even in dreams. The walls were of coral, the roof of jade stone, and chrysoprase. What is chrysoprase? I've never heard that word in my life. I never have either. I'm not even sure I'm saying that word right. Maybe it's a word from the beginning of the 1900s that we don't use anymore. How do you spell it? C-H-R-Y-S-O-P-R-A-S-E. Chris, okay. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to look it it's up. It's a weird one. Okay, so let's just recap where we are so far. We're talking about this king under the sea. Does he have these magical jewels that control the tide? Is that what they're saying? Yeah, the ebb and flow of the tide. Okay, cool. He, he runs that show. Nice. Yeah, he's got this beautiful palace. Uh, and the floors were of the finest mother of pearl. Mm. I know what pearl is. Yeah. But the Dragon King, in spite of his wide-spreading kingdom, his beautiful palace and all its wonders, and his powers, which none disputed throughout the whole sea, was not at all happy, for he reigned alone. Poor and, guy. Yeah. He's just a lonely king. Hmm. Everyone thought he had it all, but he didn't. I feel like that's uh, not uncommon for people with a lot of power. Yeah. So at last he thought that if he married, he would not only be happier, but also more powerful. So he decided to take a wife. Calling all his fish retainers together, he chose several of them as ambassadors to go through the sea and seek for a young dragon princess who would be his bride. Okay, so he has fish retainers. Did you say what he is? He's a dragon. Okay, okay. He's looking for a dragon bride. Yep. That makes sense. He's a water dragon. Yeah, sea dragon, water dragon, something okay. like that. Got it. At last, they return to the palace, bringing with them a lovely young dragon. Her scales were of glittering green like the wings of summer beetles. Her eyes threw out glances of fire, and she was dressed in gorgeous robes. All the jewels of the sea worked in with embroidery adorned them. So I guess her dress was quite fabulous there. Sounds like it. And it worked. The king fell in love with her at once, and the wedding ceremony was celebrated with great splendor. Every living thing in the sea, from great whales down to the little shrimps, came in shoals to offer their congratulations to the bride and bridegroom. You know, to be honest, I can't help but imagine like a scene from The Little Mermaid, like the Disney movie, you know, all these sea creatures dancing around and partying. <laughs> I imagined it was a little bit darker. They mentioned whales and shrimps, and I was like, Imagining a big school of shrimp coming in and a whale just swooping by and eating half of them on the way. Jeez, Paul. <laughs> okay. It's a fish-eat-fish -fish world out there, I Jason. Guess. Uh, so they all came there to wish a uh, long and prosperous life to the new couple. Never had there been such an assemblage 
or such gay festivities in the fish world before. The train of bearers who carried the bride's possessions to her new home seemed to reach across the waves from one end of the sea to the other. Each fish carried a phosphorescent lantern and was dressed in ceremonial robes gleaming blue and pink and silver, and the waves as they rose and fell and broke that night seemed to be rolling masses of white and green fire, for the phosphorus shone with double brilliancy in honor of the event. All right. Even the lights were extra special. Yeah. I can't help but notice that we haven't heard anything about a monkey or a jellyfish yet. No, they're really just building up the, the king here. Yeah. Now, for a time, the dragon king and his bride lived very happily. They loved each other dearly, and the bridegroom, day after day, took delight in showing his bride all the wonders and treasures of his coral palace. And she was never tired of wandering with him through its vast halls and garden. Life seemed to them both like a long summer's day. Two months passed in this happy way, and then the dragon queen fell ill and was obliged to stay in bed. Oh no. Here's where the story starts getting interesting. Okay. The king was sorely troubled, and when he saw his precious bride so ill, and at once sent for his fish doctor to come and give her some medicine. He gave special orders to the servants to nurse her carefully and wait upon her with diligence. But in spite of all the nurse's assiduous care and the medicine that the doctor prescribed, the young queen showed no signs of recovery, but grew daily worse. When the dragon king interviewed the doctor and blamed him for not curing the queen, the doctor was alarmed at Rin Jin's evident displeasure and excused his want of skill by saying that although he knew the right kind of medicine to give the invalid, it was impossible to find in the sea. Hmm. So the doctor's like, whoa, 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 not my fault. Don't kill me here. Yeah. Got to find somebody to go get this special medicine, it sounds like. Do you mean to tell me that you can't get the medicine here? Asked the dragon king. It's just as you say, said the doctor. Tell me what it is you want for the queen, demanded Rin Jin. I want the liver of a live monkey, answered the doctor. Oh no, that's where the monkey comes in? Yep. I didn't know we were doing voices for this, by the way. I, I haven't prepared voices for my story. I hope that's not a requirement. Why well, didn't either, but ad lib, you know. Okay. The liver of a live monkey? Of course, that will be most difficult to get, said the king. If only we could get that for the queen, her majesty would soon recover, said the doctor. Very well, that decides it. We must get it somehow or other. But where are we most likely to find a monkey, asked the king. Then the doctor told the dragon king that some distance to the south there was a monkey island where a great many monkeys lived. If only you could capture one of these monkeys, said the doctor. How can any of my people capture a monkey, said the dragon king, greatly puzzled. The monkeys live on dry land, while we live in the water, and out of our element we are quite powerless. I don't see what we can do. That has been my difficulty too, said the doctor, but amongst your innumerable servants you surely can find one that can go on shore for that express purpose. Something must be done, said the king, and calling his chief steward, he consulted him on the matter. The chief steward thought for some time, and then, as if struck by a sudden thought, said joyfully, I know what we must do. There is a kurage, jellyfish. Mm -hmm. He is certainly ugly to look at. Oh, Throwing shade at mean. the jellyfish already. I think jellyfish are really pretty animals. They are. But they were different back then. What? We'll get into it. Okay. But as he is proud of being able to walk on land with his four legs like a tortoise. What? <laughs> yeah, this, these were different jellyfish. I guess so. Let us send him to the island of monkeys to catch one. The jellyfish was then summoned to the king's presence and was told by his majesty what was required of him. The jellyfish, on being told the unexpected mission, which was to be entrusted to him, looked very troubled. 
and said that he had never been on the island in question and he has never had any experience in catching monkeys. He was afraid that he would not be able to get one. Well, said the chief steward, if you depend on your strength or dexterity, you will never catch a monkey. The only way is to play a trick on one. How can I play a trick on the monkey? I don't know how to do it, said the perplexed jellyfish. (laughs) This is what you must do, said the wily chief steward. When you approach the island of monkeys and meet some of them, you must try to get very friendly with one. Tell him that you are servant of the Dragon King and invite him to come and visit you and see the Dragon King's palace. Try and describe to him as vividly as you can the grandeur of the palace and the wonders of the sea, so as to arouse his curiosity and make him long to see it all. That's devious. Ah, he's a clever steward. Yeah, it's like, oh, why don't you come visit us for dinner? And then you don't tell him that they're the dinner. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But how am I to get the monkey here? You know monkeys don't swim, said the reluctant jellyfish. You must carry him on your back. What is the use of your shell if you can't do that, said the chief steward. This jellyfish sounds a lot like a turtle. It does, it does. (laughs) Won't he be very heavy, queried the jellyfish again. You mustn't mind that, for you are working for the Dragon King, replied the chief steward. (laughs) That's a... Answer, I guess. (laughs) I will do my best then, said the jellyfish, and he swam away from the palace and started off toward the monkey island. Swimming swiftly, he reached his destination in a few hours and landed by a convenient wave upon the shore. On looking around, he saw not far away a big pine tree with drooping branches, and on one of those branches was just what he was looking for, a live monkey. Jackpot. I'm in luck, thought the jellyfish. Now I must flatter the creature and try to entice him back with me to the palace, and my part will be done. I love the jellyfish voice. (laughs) It's what I imagine a jellyfish sounding like. (laughs) So the jellyfish slowly walked towards the pine tree. In those ancient days, the jellyfish had four legs and a hard shell like a tortoise. Oh, okay. Finally explained what is up with that. Yeah. When he got to the pine tree, he raised his voice and said, How do you do, Mr. Monkey? Isn't it a lovely day? Mr. Monkey? Yeah. A very fine day, answered the monkey from the tree. I have never seen you in this part of the world before. Where have you come from and what is your name? My name is Kurage, or Jellyfish, and I am one of the servants of the Dragon King. I have heard so much of your beautiful island that I have come on purpose to see it, answered the jellyfish. I'm very glad to see you, said the monkey. By the by, said the jellyfish. (laughs) Didn't know that was a a thing. That's that's totally a 1908 (laughs) expression. (laughs) By the by. (laughs) Have you ever seen the palace of the dragon king of the sea where I live? I have often heard of it, but I have never seen it, answered the monkey. Then you ought most surely to come. It is a great pity that you go through life without seeing it. The beauty of the palace is beyond all description. It is certainly, to my mind, the most lovely place in the world, said the jellyfish. Is it so beautiful as all that? asked the monkey in astonishment. Then the jellyfish saw his chance and went on describing to the best of his ability the beauty and grandeur of the Sea King's palace, and the wonders of the garden with its curious trees of white, pink and red coral, and still more curious fruits like great jewels hanging on the branches. The monkey grew more and more interested, and as he listened he came down the tree step by step, so as not to lose a word of the wonderful story. I've got him at last, thought the jellyfish. (laughs) But aloud, he said, Mr. Monkey, I must go back. As you have never seen the palace of the Dragon King, won't you avail yourself of this splendid opportunity by coming with me? I shall then be able to act as your guide and show you all the sights of the sea, 
which will be even more wonderful to you, a landlubber. Landlubber? <laughs> landlubber. Yeah. That's what <laughs> that's, you, that's what pirates call, you know, non-sailor people, right? Okay, okay. You never heard that before? Uh, maybe I thought it was landlubber. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, two Bs, right? Landlubber. Yep. yep. I should love to go, said the monkey. But how am I to cross the water? I can't swim, as you surely know. There is no difficulty about that. I can carry you on my back. That will be troubling you too much, said the monkey. I can do it quite easily. I am stronger than I look. So you needn't hesitate, said the jellyfish. And taking the monkey on his back, he stepped into the sea. Keep very still, Mr. Monkey, said the jellyfish. You mustn't fall into the sea. I am responsible for your safe arrival at the king's palace. Please don't go so fast, or I am sure that I shall fall off, said the monkey. Thus they went along, the jellyfish skimming through the waves with the monkey sitting on his back. When they were about halfway, the jellyfish, who knew very little of anatomy, began to wonder if the monkey had his liver with him or not. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Mr. Monkey, tell me, have you such a thing as a liver with you? The monkey was very much surprised at this queer question and asked what the jellyfish wanted with a liver. That is the most important thing of all, said the stupid jellyfish. Uh, Does it say stupid jellyfish? It does. Wow. (laughs) I'm curious how either of them would know what a liver is. (laughs) Monkeys are quite intelligent. I don't think they have like... It's a fairy tale. Medicine. It's a fairy tale, Jace. Uh, okay. <laughs> They're talking to each other. Yeah. <laughs> but these sea creatures too, right? D- are there any sea creatures besides sea mammals that even have livers? Do fish have livers? Probably. I don't know. I don't know. Never mind. I'm just, I don't know what I'm saying. We're just stupid humans. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as I recalled it, I asked you if you had yours with you. Why is my liver so important to you? Asked the monkey. Oh, you will learn the reason later, said the jellyfish. What the? Yeah, this is a stupid jellyfish. (laughs) Yeah. But I guess at this point, he can kind of just kill the monkey whenever. The monkey's kind of done for already, right? We'll find out, won't we? I guess we will. (laughs) We're getting to the climax here. Ooh. The monkey grew more and more curious and suspicious and urged the jellyfish to tell him what his liver was wanted for and ended up by appealing to his hearer's feelings by saying that he was very troubled at what he had been told. What? Sorry, I missed that. Hears feelings? What? Hearers. Hearers. His hearer's feelings. That must be like an old-timey thing. Can you read that sentence again? Sorry. Uh, sure. The monkey grew more and more curious and suspicious and urged the jellyfish to tell him for what his liver was wanted and ended up by appealing to his hearer's feelings by saying that he was very troubled at what he had been told. Okay, got it. So him as the listener or whatever, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The hearer is the person he's talking to. Yeah, must be a way of talking we don't really use anymore. Yeah. Then the jellyfish, seeing how anxious the monkey looked, was sorry for him and told him everything how the dragon queen had fallen ill and how the doctor had said that only the liver of a live monkey could cure her and how the dragon king had sent him to find one. Now I have done all that I was told, and as soon as we arrive at the palace, the doctor will want your liver. So I feel sorry for you, said the silly jellyfish. The poor monkey was horrified when he learned all this and very angry at the trick played upon him. He trembled with fear at the thought of what was in store for him. But the monkey was a clever animal, and he thought it the wisest plan not to show any sign of the fear he felt. So he tried to calm himself and think of some way in which he might escape. The doctor means to cut me open and then take my liver out? Why, I shall die, thought the monkey. At last, a bright thought struck him, and he said quite cheerfully to the jellyfish, What a pity it was, Mr. Jellyfish, that you did not speak of this before. We have left the island. If I had told why I wanted you to accompany me, you would certainly have refused to come, answered the jellyfish. You are quite mistaken, said the monkey. Monkeys can very well spare a liver or two, 
especially when it is wanted for the Dragon Queen of the Sea. If I had only guessed what you were in need of, I should have presented you with one without waiting to be asked. I have several livers, but the greatest pity is that, as you did not speak it at the time, I have left all my livers hanging on the pine tree. Have you left all your livers behind you? asked the jellyfish. Yes, said the cunning monkey. During the daytime, I usually leave my livers hanging up on the branch of a tree, as it is very much in the way when I am climbing about from tree to tree. Today, listening to your interesting conversation, I quite forgot it and left it behind when I came off with you. If only you had spoken in time, I should have remembered it and should have brought it along with me. The jellyfish was very disappointed when he heard this, for he believed every word the monkey said. The monkey was no good without a liver. Finally, the jellyfish stopped and told the monkey so. Well, said the monkey, that is soon remedied. I am very sorry to think of all your trouble, but if you will only take me back to that place where you found me, I shall be able to get my liver. The jellyfish did not like the idea of going all the way back to the island again, but the monkey assured him that if he would be so kind as to take him back, he would get his best liver and bring it with him next time. Thus persuaded, the jellyfish turned his course towards the monkey island once more. No sooner had the jellyfish reached the shore than the sly monkey landed, and getting up into the pine tree where the jellyfish had first seen him, he cut several capers amongst the branches with joy at being safe home again, and then looking down at the jellyfish said, So many thanks for all the trouble you have taken. Please present my compliments to the Dragon King on your return. The jellyfish wondered at this speech and the mocking tone at which it was uttered. Then he asked the monkey if it wasn't his intention to come with him at once getting his liver. The monkey replied laughingly that he couldn't afford to lose his liver. It was too precious. But remember your promise, (laughs) pleaded the jellyfish, now very discouraged. That promise was false, and anyhow it is now broken, answered the monkey. Then he began to jeer at the jellyfish and told him that he had been deceiving him the whole time and that he had no wish to lose his life, which he certainly would have done had he gone to the Sea King's palace, to the old doctor waiting for him, instead of persuading the jellyfish to return him under false pretenses. Of course I won't give you my liver, but come and get it if you can, added the monkey mockingly from the tree. There was nothing for the jellyfish to do now, but to repent of his stupidity, and to return to the Dragon King of the Sea and confess his failure. So he started sadly and slowly to swim back. The last thing he heard as he glided away, leaving the island behind him, was the monkey laughing at him. (laughs) Meanwhile, the Dragon King, the doctor, the chief steward, and all the servants were waiting impatiently for the return of the jellyfish. When they caught sight of him approaching the palace, they hailed him with delight. They began to thank him profusely for all the trouble he had taken in going to Monkey Island. And then they asked him where the monkey was. Oh no. Now the day of reckoning had come for the jellyfish. He quaked all over as he told his story. How he had brought the monkey halfway over the sea and then had stupidly let out the secret of his commission how the monkey had deceived him by making him believe that he had left his liver behind him. The Dragon King's wrath was great, and he at once gave orders that the jellyfish was to be severely punished. The punishment was a horrible one. All the bones were to be drawn out of his living body, and he was to be beaten with sticks. It finally makes sense. (laughs) How the jellyfish became the jellyfish. The poor jellyfish, humiliated and horrified beyond all words, cried out for pardon. But the dragon's king order had to be obeyed. The servants of the palace forthwith each brought out a stick and surrounded the jellyfish. And after pulling out his bones, they beat him to a flat pulp and then took him out beyond the palace gates and threw him into the water, where he was left to suffer and repent his foolish chattering 
and to grow accustomed to his new state of bonelessness. From this story, it is evident that in former times, the jellyfish once had a shell and bone something like a tortoise. But ever since the Dragon King sentence was carried out on the ancestor of the jellyfishes, his descendants have all been soft and boneless, just as you see them today, thrown up by the waves high upon the shores of Japan. And that's how the jellyfish became the jellyfish. Wow. That's a cool story. That was fun. Yeah. I uh, quite like that one. Yeah. It's a little violent at the end, but... Uh, a little bit. Ripping bones out. Doesn't tell you whatever happened to the dragon queen. Yeah. Did she die? Did she live? Who knows? The story wasn't really about yeah. her. That She was just set up. Yeah. Interesting. Good story, Paul. Good choice. Thank you. Thank you. What have you got for us today, Jason? I will be reading the story of Princess Hase. And I'm going to be injecting some commentary and notes, too, because I was surprised at how many topics that we've already covered before in previous episodes, come up in this story. Okay. Okay. You ready to hear the story? <clears throat> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to hear this one. I purposely didn't read this one, so it would be a surprise and yeah. exciting when you read it to me. Yeah. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> <sighs> many, many years ago, there lived in Nara, the ancient capital of Japan, Boom, right there. We've already talked about the ancient capital, Nara. Oh, it's come up a few times. Yeah. So in, in Nara, a wise state minister by name Prince Toyonari Fujiwara. His wife was a noble, good, and beautiful woman named Princess Murasaki. Murasaki means violet. So she's Princess Violet. Okay, that's a good name. Yeah. They had been married by their respective families, according to Japanese custom, when very young, and had lived together happily ever since. They had, however, one cause for great sorrow, for as the years went by, no child was born to them. This made them very unhappy, for they both longed to see a child of their own who would grow up to gladden their old age, carry on the family name, and keep up the ancestral rites when they were dead. The prince and his lovely wife, after long consultation and much thought, determined to make a pilgrimage to the temple of Hase no Kanon, goddess of mercy at Hase. Now, we've talked about Kanon, goddess of mercy, in the Kiyomizadera episode, yep. right? Yep. And Hase, I don't remember if we mentioned it in an episode, but... That's located in Kamakura, which is an area kind of southwest of Tokyo along the coast. There are a bunch of temples there. Very cool place. I spent a day there, and it's oh, there's so much cool stuff to see there. Oh, that's actually right near Hasedera is where that giant Buddha is, the one that was shifted by that big earthquake. Okay. We, talk, we mentioned that at, yeah, at the very least. Definitely. Okay. So we got Hasedera, Hase no Kanon, a temple to Kanon, the goddess of mercy. And the prince and his wife went there, for they believed, according to the beautiful tradition of their religion, that the mother of mercy, Kanon, comes to answer the prayers of mortals in the form that they need the most. That's another thing. We talked about how Kanon has many different forms depending on what people need, right? Correct. Surely, after all these years of prayer, she would come to them in the form of a beloved child in answer to their special pilgrimage for that was the greatest need of their two lives. Everything else they had that this life could give them, but it was all as nothing, because the cry of their hearts was unsatisfied. That's sad. Yeah. So the prince, Toyonari, and his wife went to the temple of Kanon at Hase and stayed there for a long time, both daily offering incense and praying to Kanon, the Heavenly Mother, to grant them the desire of their whole lives and their prayer was answered. A daughter was born at last to the princess Murasaki, and great was the joy of her heart. On presenting the child to her husband, they both decided to call her Hasehime, or the princess of Hase, because she was the gift of Kanon at that place. 
They both reared her with great care and tenderness, and the child grew in strength and beauty. When the little girl was five years old, her mother fell dangerously ill. Oh, no. Yeah. Doesn't that seem like a common theme in these kinds of stories? Somebody always falls ill. You know, in ancient times, people died a lot. Yeah. A lot of illnesses that they couldn't really treat very well. Yeah. So the mother fell dangerously ill, and all the doctors and their medicines could not save her. A little before she breathed her last, she called her daughter to her and gently stroking her head said, I need to do a voice, don't I? Well, she's dying, so I only have to do the voice once. The dying voice. (laughs) Oh yeah, dying voice. Okay. Hasehime, do you know that your mother cannot live any longer? Oh, this is a long monologue. It's going to be hard to do that. (laughs) Okay. Though I die, you must grow up a good girl. Do your best not to give trouble to your nurse or any other of your family. Perhaps your father will marry again and someone will fill my place as your mother. If so, do not grieve for me, but look upon your father's second wife as your true mother and be obedient and filial to her, both her and your father. Remember when you are grown up to be submissive to those who are your superiors and to be kind to all those who are under you. Don't forget this. I die with the hope that you will grow up a model woman. Hasehime listened in an attitude of respect while her mother spoke and promised to do all that she was told. There's a proverb which says, As the soul is at three, so it is at one hundred. And so Hasehime grew up as her mother had wished, a good and obedient little princess, though she was now too young to understand how great was the loss of her mother. How you feeling? Sad. I'm sad. Yeah. Not long after the death of his first wife, Prince Toyonari married again, a lady of noble birth named Princess Terute. Very different in character, alas, to the good and wise Princess Murasaki, this woman had a cruel bad heart. She did not love her stepdaughter at all, and it was often very unkind to the little motherless girl, saying to herself, This is not my child. This is not my child. That's awful, isn't it? But Hasehime bore every unkindness with patience and even waited upon her stepmother kindly and obeyed her in every way and never gave any trouble, just as she had been trained by her own good mother, so that the lady Terute had no cause for complaint against her. The little princess was very diligent and her favorite studies were music and poetry. She would spend several hours practicing every day, and her father had the most proficient of masters he could find to teach her the koto, a Japanese harp. We mentioned that in the Geisha episode, didn't we? Mm, Yeah, I believe so. Also, she was taught the art of writing letters and verse. When she was 12 years of age, she could play so beautifully that she and her stepmother were summoned to the palace to perform before the emperor. Wow. Yeah, that's a big deal. It was the Festival of the Cherry Flowers. Huh? (laughs) Cherry Blossom Festival? We definitely have talked about that. A whole episode about that. Yeah. And there were great festivities at the court. The emperor threw himself into the enjoyment of the season and commanded that Princess Hase should perform before him on the koto and that her mother, Princess Terute, should accompany her on the flute. The emperor sat on a raised dais, before which was hung a curtain of finely sliced bamboo and purple tassels, so that his majesty might see all and not be seen, for no ordinary subject was allowed to look upon his sacred face. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, a little pretentious there, emperor. All right. A little bit. Hasehime was a skilled musician, though so young, and often astonished her masters by her wonderful memory and talent. On this momentous occasion, she played well. But Princess Terute, her stepmother, who was a lazy woman and never took the trouble to practice daily, broke down in her accompaniment and had to request one of the court ladies to take her place. Ooh, embarrassing. For real. This was a great disgrace, 
and she was furiously jealous to think that she had failed where her stepdaughter succeeded. And to make matters worse, the emperor sent many beautiful gifts to the little princess to reward her for playing so well at the palace. Mega burn to uh, princess, what's her name? Terute. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to hurt. Well, she should practice more. Yeah, she brought it on herself. She did. She's lazy. Yeah. There was also now another reason why Princess Terute hated her stepdaughter, for she had had the good fortune to have a son born to her, and in her inmost heart she kept saying, If only Hasehime were not here, my son would have all the love of his father. She's not a nice lady. Awful. Like you can't love more than one child at a time. Yeah. And never having learned to control herself, she allowed this wicked thought to grow into the awful desire of taking her stepdaughter's life. Oh, no. Yeah. So one day, she secretly ordered some poison and poisoned some sweet wine. This poisoned wine she put into a bottle. Into another similar bottle, she poured some good wine. It was the occasion of the Boys' Festival on the 5th of May. Huh? <laughs> boys' Festival, 5th of May, also known as Children's Day, I think. Mm -hmm. Talked about that in the Koi episode. Remember, they would hang those Koi banners to wish that the, the boys would grow up all strong like Koi. I thought that was crazy that we came across that in this. <laughs> we just talked about that not too long ago. <clears throat> anyway, it was that day and Hasehime was playing with her little brother. All his toys of warriors and heroes were spread out, and she was telling him wonderful stories about each of them. They were both enjoying themselves and laughing merrily with their attendants when his mother entered with the two bottles of wine and some delicious cakes. You are both so good and happy. <laughs> That's probably not how she said it. <laughs> <laughs> you are both so good and happy, said the wicked princess Terote with a smile that I have brought you some sweet wine as a reward. And here are some rice cakes for my good children. Now she, Hasehime knows something's up. Yeah. Like, She's being nice to me. This is what's, uncharacteristic. What's going on? Yeah. And she filled two cups from the different bottles. Well, I guess, I guess Hasehime didn't suspect anything. <laughs> it says, Hasehime, never dreaming of the dreadful part her stepmother was acting, took one of the cups of wine and gave to her little stepbrother the other that had been poured out for him. The wicked woman had carefully marked the poisoned bottle, but upon coming into the room, she had grown nervous, and pouring out the wine hurriedly, she had unconsciously given the poisoned cup to her own child. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All this time, she was anxiously watching the little princess, but to her amazement, no change whatever took place in the young girl's face. Suddenly, the little boy screamed and threw himself on the floor, doubled up with pain. His mother flew to him, taking the precaution to upset the two tiny jars of wine which she had brought into the room and lifted him up. The attendants rushed for the doctor, but nothing could save the child. He died within the hour in his mother's arms. Oh my goodness. Doctors did not know much in those ancient times, and it was thought that the wine had disagreed with the boy, causing convulsions of which he died. Okay. Thus was the wicked woman punished in losing her own child when she had tried to do away with her stepdaughter. But instead of blaming herself, of course, she began to hate Hasehime more than ever in the bitterness and wretchedness of her own heart and she eagerly watched for an opportunity to do her harm, which was, however, long in coming. And uh, did you mention that hime is a suffix that means princess? Yeah, I mean, I said that hase hime means princess of hase. Oh. I know the story kind of goes back and forth between princess hase and yeah. hase hime. Thanks for pointing that out. Yep, hime princess. When Hasehime was 13 years of age, she had already become mentioned as a poetess of some merit. So I just, I noticed this is kind of interesting that at this point in the story, she's becoming 13 years of age, which means that 
she and her younger stepbrother were served wine when they were much younger, apparently. Everybody drank wine back then because the water was so crappy that you could get sick from it. And the wine, it was less alcoholic, though. It wasn't like wine today. It was like, I, I, I don't know exactly, but like one or two percent alcohol or something like that. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, so she's 13, already become mentioned as a poetess of some merit. This was an accomplishment very much cultivated by the women of old Japan and one held in high esteem. Yeah, it seems like they're building her up as like the perfect lady of the time. Totally. She's eloquent, she obeys, she's a great musician, she does poetry. Mm -hmm. A lot of the same kinds of arts that geisha are trained in. Yep, yeah, but all, it all goes back. Yep. It was the rainy season at Nara, and floods were reported every day as doing damage in the neighborhood. The river Tatsuta, which flowed through the Imperial Palace grounds, was swollen to the top of its banks, and the roaring of the torrents of water rushing along a narrow bed so disturbed the emperor's rest day and night that a serious nervous disorder was the result. Oh, wow. That sounds like a pretty, what's the word, delicate? He was too pampered. Yeah, to develop a nervous disorder because of water, like the sound of water outside? Come on. I guess nervous disorders go all the way back, too. I guess. So an imperial edict was sent forth to all the Buddhist temples, commanding the priests to offer up continuous prayers to heaven to stop the noise of the flood. But this was of no avail. Then it was whispered in court circles that the Princess Hase, the daughter of Prince Toyonari Fujiwara, second minister at court, was the most gifted poetess of the day though still so young, and her masters confirmed the report. Long ago, a beautiful and gifted maiden poetess had moved heaven by praying in verse, had brought down rain upon a land famished with drought. So said the ancient biographers of the poetist Ono no Komachi. If the princess Hase were to write a poem and offer it in prayer, might it not stop the noise of the rushing river? and remove the cause of the imperial illness? What the court said at last reached the ears of the emperor himself, and he sent an order to the minister, Prince Toyonari, to this effect. Great indeed was Hasehime's fear and astonishment when her father sent for her and told her what was required of her. Heavy indeed was the duty that was laid on her young shoulders, that of saving the emperor's life by the merit of her verse. Yeah, that's a little bit of pressure. Yeah, a little bit. At last the day came and her poem was finished. It was written on a leaflet of paper heavily flecked with gold dust. With her father and attendants and some of the court officials, she proceeded to the bank of the roaring torrent and raising up her heart to heaven, she read the poem she had composed, aloud, lifting it heavenwards in her two hands. Strange indeed, it seemed to all those standing around. The waters ceased their roaring, and the river was quiet in direct answer to her prayer. After this, the emperor soon recovered his health. Good wow. job, Hasehime. Wow. Magical. She really is a byproduct of the gods. Apparently. His majesty was highly pleased and sent for her to the palace and rewarded her with the rank of Chinjo that of Lieutenant General, to distinguish her. Oh, wow. It's a big honor. From that time, she was called Chinjo Hime, or the Lieutenant General Princess, and respected and loved by all. Except her stepmother. Yeah, that crappy lady. There was only one person who was not pleased at Hasehime's success. There Guess we go. who? <laughs> that one was her stepmother forever brooding over the death of her own child whom she had killed when trying to poison her stepdaughter, she had the mortification of seeing her rise to power and honor marked by imperial favor and the admiration of the whole court. Her envy and jealousy burned in her heart like fire. Many were the lies she carried to her husband about Hasehime, but all to no purpose. He would listen to none of her tales, telling her sharply that she was quite mistaken. 
At last, the stepmother, seizing the opportunity of her husband's absence, uh oh, ordered one of her old servants to take the innocent girl to the Hibati Mountains, the wildest part of the country, and to kill her there. She invented a dreadful story about the little princess, saying that this was the only way to prevent disgrace falling upon the family by killing her. Uh, okay. Yeah, what could you possibly say about somebody that's so perfect, you know? Right, right. No one's going to believe her. Yeah. Katoda, her vassal, was bound to obey his mistress. Anyhow, he saw that it would be the wisest plan to pretend obedience in the absence of the girl's father, so he placed Hasehime in a palanquin. Palanquin? How do you pronounce that? Palanquin, I believe. Okay. And that's like the litter. The, the kind of thing it's um like a carriage but the type that the people carry on their shoulders yeah that's what i thought yeah it's just like the litter the mikoshi that we talked about in the temples and shrines or no the matsuri one yeah the matsuri yep. episode they're carrying somebody around in this thing in that case it was the kami they're carrying around but carry on people in that too okay so they stuck the princess in a palanquin and accompanied her to the most solitary place he could find in the wild district. The poor child knew there was no good in protesting to her unkind stepmother at being sent away in this strange manner, so she went as she was told. She's a good, obedient girl. Yeah. But the old servant knew that the young princess was quite innocent of all the things her stepmother had invented to him as reasons for her outrageous orders, and he determined to save her life. Unless he killed her, however... He could not return to his cruel taskmistress, so he decided to stay out in the wilderness. With the help of some peasants, he soon built a little cottage, and having sent secretly for his wife to come, these two good old people did all in their power to take care of the now unfortunate princess. She all the time trusted in her father, knowing that as soon as he returned home and found her absent, he would search for her. Prince Toyonari, after some weeks, came home and was told by his wife that his daughter Hime had done something wrong and had run away for fear of being punished. That doesn't sound like her. Doesn't add up. He was nearly ill with anxiety. Everyone in the house told the same story, that Hase Hime had suddenly disappeared. None of them knew why or whither. There's another old word for you. <laughs> For fear of scandal, he kept the matter quiet and searched everywhere he could think of, but all to no purpose. One day, trying to forget his terrible worry, he called all his men together and told them to make ready for a several days hunt in the mountains. They were soon ready and mounted, waiting at the gate for their lord. He rode hard and fast to the district of the Hibari Mountains, a great company following him. He was soon far ahead of everyone, and at last found himself in a narrow, picturesque valley. Looking round and admiring the scenery, he noticed a tiny house on one of the hills quite near, and then he distinctly heard a beautiful, clear voice reading aloud. Who could that be? <laughs> Seized with curiosity as to who could be studying so diligently in such a lonely spot, he dismounted, and leaving his horse to his groom, he walked up the hillside and approached the cottage. As he drew nearer, his surprise increased, for he could see that the reader was a beautiful girl. The cottage was wide open, and she was sitting facing the view. Listening attentively, he heard her reading the Buddhist scriptures with great devotion. More and more curious, he hurried on to the tiny gate and entered the little garden, and looking up, beheld his lost daughter Hasehime. All right. Happy reunion. She was so intent on what she was saying that she neither heard nor saw her father till he spoke. Hasehime, he cried. It is you, my Hasehime. How's, is my, are my voices okay? Yeah. I'm glad yeah. I don't have nearly as many voices to do as you did. <laughs> Taken by surprise, she could hardly realize that it was her own dear father who was calling her. And for a moment, she was utterly bereft of the power to speak or move. My father, my father, it is indeed you, oh, my father, was all she could say. And running to him, she caught hold of his thick sleeve 
and burying her face, burst into a passion of tears. Her father stroked her dark hair, asking her gently to tell him all that had happened, but she only wept on, and he wondered if he were not really dreaming. Then the faithful old servant, Katoda, came out, and bowing himself to the ground before his master, poured out the long tale of wrong, telling him all that had happened, and how it was that he found his daughter in such a wild and desolate spot, with only two old servants to take care of her. The prince's astonishment and indignation knew no bounds. He's angry. So, the prince seems like a decent guy, but like, he's been married to this woman for like, years now uh-huh. and she's just been awful the whole time and now he's like wait she's awful like how did you not how are you so disconnected that you never knew how awful she was being to your daughter a little bit of this is on him yeah i don't know i mean i'm thinking princes and princesses they have a lot of like royal duties to attend to right i can imagine like the princess was probably off being cared for by maids and whatever while the prince is doing his thing. Maybe he wasn't around as much as he, you know, should have been. Absent father. I don't know. They seem to love each other, though. Yeah. So anyway, the prince, he gave up the hunt at once and hurried home with his daughter. One of the company galloped ahead to inform the household of the glad news. What? I know. Why would you do that, (laughs) right? Wouldn't you want to surprise the stepmother and, like... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the stepmother, hearing what had happened and fearful of meeting her husband now that her wickedness was discovered, fled from the house and returned in disgrace to her father's roof, and nothing more was heard of her. But yeah, it seems to me like he totally missed out on an opportunity to punish her for being a terrible person. Yeah. Well, she had to live the rest of her life in disgrace. Yeah. That's something. Yeah, that's something. And her son was already dead by her own hand. True. That poor kid is like the real biggest victim of this whole story. Yeah. So the old servant, Katoda, was rewarded with the highest promotion in his master's service and lived happily to the end of his days, devoted to the little princess who never forgot that she owed her life to this faithful retainer. She was no longer troubled by an unkind stepmother and her days passed happily and quietly with her father. As Prince Toyonari had no son, he adopted a younger son of one of the court nobles to be his heir and to marry his daughter, Hasehime. And in a few years, the marriage took place. Hasehime lived to a good old age, and all said that she was the wisest, most devout, and most beautiful mistress that had ever reigned in Prince Toyonari's ancient house. She had the joy of presenting her son, the future lord of the family, to her father just before he retired from active life. To this day, there is preserved a piece of needlework in one of the Buddhist temples of Kyoto. It is a beautiful piece of tapestry with the figure of Buddha embroidered in the silky threads drawn from the stem of the lotus. This is said to have been the work of the hands of the good Princess Hase. Really? We gotta go check that out. That is the end of the story. And I actually looked into that tapestry. I'm yeah. Like, you know, this story was translated in 1908. It was told, you know, for a Centuries long time before that. Yeah. Like, does this thing still exist? It does. But it's not in Kyoto. It's actually in a temple in Katsuragi, a city in Nara Prefecture. Okay. So not too far from Kyoto still. It's kind of south away is from Kyoto. It's called the Taima Mandala. And you can see it at Taima Dera, Taima Temple. And it is one of the national treasures of Japan. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is. Another notable thing about that temple is it's the only one in Japan to have its original twin pagodas intact. Okay. They date back to around 710 CE, which is like around the time this story happened. Yeah, that's when Nara was the capital of Japan. Yeah. So... I don't know. There were just so many little pieces of this story where I'm like, I've heard of this place or, you know, these are concepts we've talked about. I thought it was cool to bring it all together in that story. Yeah. Next time I'm in Nara, definitely yeah. swinging by. Yeah. 
But man, what is it about evil stepmothers in fairy tales? That's such a common theme, it seems like. It's just an easy trope to throw out there for a bad guy. Were there just that many bad stepmothers? <laughs> no, I would assume not, but it's like an easy way to make a character that has power over the other character's life. Yeah. If it were like a bad neighbor, it'd be like, well, whatever, ignore them. Sure. Can't get away from your stepmother. Yeah. Did you notice any uh, similarities between this and Cinderella? I mean... Ah, uh, the wicked stepmother. Yeah, maybe that's kind of the main thing, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, the the evil stepmother gets her comeuppance and the, the princess is like, everybody loves her and stuff. I don't know. I saw that this story has been called the Japanese Cinderella. Yeah, I mean, I could see it. Yeah. Good anyway. story. I like that. Thanks. Those are the stories. Hope you enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd actually, before we did this episode, I tested the waters a little bit on Instagram. I put my first poll out there for our listeners. Did you see that? I did. I didn't. I didn't vote. Good. Didn't want to taint didn't the want, results. Didn't want to taint the results. Yeah. But we got a, a bunch of responses and only one person said that they weren't interested. So to that person, sorry, <laughs> but to everybody else. You know, I hope you enjoyed it. And let us know if you want to hear more episodes like this. There are a bunch of other stories in this collection that we could read in future episodes if that interests you. So give us feedback if you feel like it. You can reach us on Instagram. We're SJP Podcast on Instagram. You can send an email to feedback at sightseeingjapanpodcast.com. You can visit our website, sightseeingjapanpodcast.com. We have a contact form there if you'd prefer to do it that way. And if you're not interested in hearing more folk tales, you know, tell us that, and we're always open to other suggestions. Not that we're running out of ideas or anything. We got a long list, but... We got a long list. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks for listening. On the next episode... Oh, oh, I'm... Oh, man. Oh, Paul. <laughs> I totally messed up. <laughs> what are we talking about next time? Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to... Oh, man. <laughs> Irezumi. Japanese tattoos. And speaking of listener request, this was a listener request. Yes, it was. But we're also into it too. So it's yeah. going to be a great episode. Yes, absolutely. We're going to dive deep into the world of Japanese tattoos. Yep. Is that it this time? That's it. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, again, thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>